Hey, this is Brett Gersky. Welcome to another episode of On The List. This is episode number 62. It's April 2021. We are coming to you from the Believe Podcast Network. My guest today is a good friend of mine who's also a very talented actress. You know her and love her from such roles as Sloan on the Emmy-winning HBO comedy series Entourage and as Dahlia in the movie You Don't Mess With The Zohan. Her new show, Superman and Lois, is such a big hit that it got renewed for season two after just the first episode. She's bringing Lana Lang to life every Tuesday night on The CW. Of course, I'm talking about Emmanuel Shrieky. What's up? Hi, honey. How are you? Good. I haven't seen you since before quarantine. I mean, I was about to say, it's so good to see you. I know. Isn't it crazy that like just seeing people over the computer is such a relief just to see different faces? 100%. And, you know, it's a crazy thing because you realize, you know, living in L.A., how our lives are filled with people that we love, but that we don't see. Right? (laughs) You go to the bar, you go to the club or you're at a premiere. When you take all that out, you're like, oh, my God. What? Like, first of all, your circle is like that big. Right. And then you see, like, I haven't seen you in like, what, over a year? And I'm like really happy to see you Brett. I know same I know but you're right it's something about LA I always try to explain that to people that um especially when people are working in film and television you leave town so often that your friend could be like I'm off to make a movie and that's three months or I'm off to do a tv show and that's nine months and then they text you like just got back to town and you make sure to get drinks or dinner because they're going to be gone again you know it's like you're right you really have to like take every moment that you can to see people. And then the rest of it is just texting and FaceTime. But, you know, the quarantine, you're right, took every little chance encounter away yeah. from us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm used to seeing you when I go to Earth Bar, when I pick up my acai bowl <laughs> or my blueberry bliss. I know Emmanuel is going to be there picking something up. Hey, around the corner for me. God, yeah. I do want Earth Bar. I wow. know. What's your Thank go-to? You. What was your go-to at Earth Bar? Well, you know, I change it up, but like I, I'm big on the like celery juice in the morning. Oh, so nice. last year I would just call in like, you know, my medium celery, pure celery, but I like to do like an all green juice, not too sweet. Yeah. Um, and then when I feel like a treat, I like doing the chocolate supreme. Oh, nice. Good. Special occasions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of which, actually, happy Passover. It's Passover oh, right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hak Samea. Yeah, Hak fellow members of the tribe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw you posted on Instagram that you did a virtual Seder this year. Both, both, night. you know, it's so funny, Brett, like leading up to Seder number one. Yeah. I honestly, like, I wasn't feeling it. And when I say that, it's kind of a big deal because I love the holidays and I look right. forward. I love getting together with my family and you know, I, I always joke that I'm actually one of the few that like practices. Yeah. And I love it. It's meaningful to me. And this year I was like, oh my God, it's Passover and we're going to do it Zoom again. Right. Ugh. But it ended up being really great. Yeah. It ended up being great. And I was so happy to really go the extra mile but you will laugh so hard because i'm here in vancouver canada right i go to three grocery stores to find matzah (laughs) and kosher wine and i would be like kosher for passover and they looked at me like i had three heads and i was like Siberia right now (laughs) (laughs) right because yeah la and new york you can find it pretty easily yeah it's like a non-issue anyway a nice holiday how was your holiday yeah well last year i did the zoom thing because it was just me and my dog buddy quarantining in la this year i was able to be home in new jersey with the family which was awesome uh and you know you appreciate it even more because if you were on zoom last year and you remember how strange it is to be at a zoom seder you know that you this year was like you appreciate it more than ever you know so i can't believe you had to do two in a row so far two years in a row row. Yeah. yeah So next yeah. year, next year you'll be back with your family. Here Hopefully. in person. What do we say? Next year in Jerusalem? Next this year in Jerusalem. Next year in person. <laughs> yeah, next year in person. Exactly. Uh, and you're always you're always wishing people a, a Shabbat Shalom on Instagram. Did you grow up in a very religious home? Were you Orthodox growing up? It's not 
it's not a very religious home. I, I would I would say if I had to label it, I would call it modern orthodox. Okay. And by that, I mean kosher at home, yeah. milk and meat, sinks, uh, elementary school, racing in the winter to get home to light the Shabbat candles because it would start at like 4.13 p.m. Right. <laughs> The hot water over the, you know, the Sabbath, Friday nights, not allowed to go out. Right. You know, and I lived in a, in a town uh, called Unionville, and um, there was two Jewish families. There was us and the Levies. So, like, all my friends were, like, white Canadian Christian. And they mm -hmm. would be like, oh, em, Em's got to do that Friday night thing. And <laughs> So just invite them. It's like, you should come for dinner. <laughs> right, exactly, right. If I can't go to you, you come to me. Yeah, exactly. And they were obsessed with the challah bread. Obsessed. Oh, of course. How can you not be? Um, but yeah, so I definitely grew up, you know, in a very traditional family. And my parents are Moroccan, so it's that added, like, Sephardic, mm -hmm. Moroccan thing that was very, very strong. Yeah, and you've kept it up, which is nice. Even I try. Even yeah. in quarantine in Vancouver, <laughs> you've kept it up. Vancouver. You know what? It brings meaning. Mm -hmm. Like just it, it's a it's like a the mark of time. Like every time Friday rolls around and you know, you spend so much time in, in isolation, it would be like, okay, well, I'm I'm still bringing in the weekend. Like happy Friday, Shabbat Shalom. Like Yeah, absolutely count you yeah. know because like every fades <laughs> into one day into the other <laughs> right that's true that's actually a really that's an interesting way of looking at it that's yeah. cool um so just to give people a little backstory on how we know each other i think we we maybe have known each other like 15 years because i think i met you through lance bass our mutual friend and I've known Lance since at least 2006 because I had written a script that he wanted to produce and we had like a business dinner and then he started having game nights and introduced me to a lot of people. So I think that's how we met. That's got to be. <laughs> yeah. That's got to be because you sort of went into, you know, promoting and clubs. Yeah, the nightlife world. After. Uh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a few years later. Yeah. yeah. Then for sure, that's how we know each other. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, exactly. And you were on, yeah, when I met you, you were doing Entourage, so it has to be around that time. Um, but yeah, uh, we have a lot of mutual friends. Jamie Sigler, we were at her wedding. Um, yeah. So yeah, we always get to see each other at events like that, Lance's wedding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the 15 years have gone very fast. There have been a lot of birthday parties. There have been a lot of weddings, a lot of game nights, a lot of parties. Yes. Um, you are oh, my most epic yes. that literally, let me tell you something. Yeah. Everybody talks about that party. It was lit. That birthday party. Jenna and I, Jenna was turning 35. I was turning 40. Yes. Jenna Duan. A party. Jenna Duan. Yeah. What that was. I know. I was going to, I was, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say to you, at one point, I was probably throwing three to five parties a week, you know? Yeah. And out of all the parties I've thrown between 2007 and 2019, that is one of the most memorable ever. Uh, <laughs> that party. It was so much fun. I mean, it was in the back room of Bootsy Bellows. We did like a private party, joint birthday, like you said, for you and Jenna Duan. We had drinks named after you guys. Um, what was the dress code? You guys had a dress code like dress, uh, like dance casual yeah, or something. Had um, sneakers only, right? And it was the uh, '90s hip hop and R&B. Yeah. And we had like a photo booth, and I mean, yeah, that party was lit. Are you kidding? And Jenna with all her dancers, and I remember all <laughs> my friends that like were not in the business. They were so floored. They were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait what's happening oh what? yeah slice of life baby <laughs> right it was a great way to bring in the 40th birthday yeah that's right and yeah like you said she's a professional dancer so when people got on the dance floor they dance you were like watching dance offs oh yeah it was incredible yeah just to give people an idea in case they didn't see the many photo booth pictures that were posted from that night for weeks after uh it was emmanuel jenna duan channing tatum also a professional dancer uh adam levine and bahati 
uh, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis, Jessica Alba and Cash Warren, just like all these like power couples. <laughs> and, then, and then the funniest part of all, Brett, is like, I remember, I guess, you know, the way LA is somehow or other, people heard that there was this great party happening. Oh, yeah. Remember at one point in the night and like, I was just three sheets to the wind. And I'm Jenna and I were like, we're on the dance floor and I was just, you know, whatever in all my glory. And this really sweet girl comes up to me and she's like, hi, you guys, happy birthday. And I was like, oh, thank you. And I had no idea who I was talking to. And oh, Jenna, and she was like, she was, you have no idea who that was, do you? And I was like, she was like, that's Selena Gomez. I was like, what? She's like, did you invite her? I was like, no, did you? <laughs> Wait, that's so funny. I forgot Selena was there. That's right. You know why? Because Bootsy Bellows, the way it's set up, there's a front room with like a massive club and then the private party back room. So I guess, you know, if Selena Gomez says she wants to go to the back room, they bring her to the back room. Don't say no to Selena. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what yeah. a, thank you. That was I know. such a Oh, it was the best. Yeah, we're still talking about it five years later. Uh, and speaking of time flying, uh, we just passed the one year anniversary of quarantining in March. And where did you end up spending most of the quarantine? Were you in LA or were you already in Vancouver? How have, have the first you been it? Month. Well, that doesn't make sense. We started in March, right? We started in March. March yeah, it's been one year. April, May, June, July. August, September. So the first seven months, wow. I was in, uh, at my home. Yep. And then, <laughs> where else would I be? And <laughs> then I came and I've been in Vancouver since September. Wow. So base almost half and half. Wow. Yeah. And what's yeah. it been like? What have you been, how have you been getting through the last year? Real talk. Yeah. Real talk, real talk. Um, I mean, the last year, I mean, oh man, Brett, it's been crazy. I mean, you know, I like, I just keep saying this. I just keep saying like, I consider myself to be a pretty even keeled, pretty grounded person. Yeah. Um, you know, I generally have my wits about me. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I have struggled. And I've struggled with like depression, mm -hmm. being in isolation, in solitude, feeling like crazy. And I was like, wow, this is happening to me. Mm -hmm. What are the people that really, really suffer from mental health right. or have, you know, situations that aren't quite so blessed? Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm, I'm struggling and I have a beautiful place to live and I'm working Yeah, and I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. So it really is like a crazy perspective and it's something I think about a lot. Um, but I think that it doesn't matter who you are. This mm -hmm. pen has had a way with you, whether you got sick or not. Right. It had its way with you. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, and I just think every day is so different. Like some days I wake up, I feel hopeful and the sun is out and I'm like, I'm like in a good place. And some days I wake up and I'm just like, I don't want to get out of bed today. Yeah. That's just the reality. And I think, you know, for me, I, what's been especially trying is, um, you know, being here in Vancouver, the borders are closed. So oh, they're right. so traveling back and forth. I can't come home to see my boyfriend or my friends or anything. So, you know, I've seen my, I've seen my boyfriend um, once in September. Wow. You know, and it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's emotional. And it's when you're not busy every day working, you know, you're also expected to be even more safe than whatever BC government is recommending because right. God forbid there's a shutdown and we've had a f several. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's been, it's been really difficult. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. It's no, not, no. it's not been easy. 
I think that's important for people to hear, though, because they, it tells them that they're not alone in what they're going through. You oh, know? yeah. God. So not alone. Like, yeah. so not alone. And again, and I say that knowing that, like, every situation is so different, like, because, you know, for me, I, the, the feedback I keep getting is like, oh, yeah, but you should be so grateful you're working. And I'm like, I am grateful that at this point, gratitude has basically lost its meaning. It's mm -hmm. not even about gratitude. I, this is how I live my life. It's yeah. about um, how am I feeling today? Right. Do you know? like, can I rise above this emotion that I'm feeling today? Yeah. And, and it's weird because it's unprecedented. We don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. We don't, we're not used to isolating for this long. Right. Oh, yeah. I've been traveling my whole life, being on location around the world my whole life. I'm used to being alone. <laughs> yeah. I'm like up to here with it. <laughs> yeah. well, it's a different kind of alone. You know, you were alone, but you were able to explore the city you were in, visit friends, have friends visit you, hang out with the crew, yes. you know. Like yeah. anyone who's been on a film set or a movie set, you know, people can go out after. Now you can't do that. You can't socialize. You can't socialize. Yeah. That's that's a big factor, the whole social part of it. It's really just the work. Um, but I, I remember when it first, when the lockdown first started, I thought maybe it would be a week or two. Because I was like, how can restaurants be closed for longer than a week? Like it didn't compute how this was going to happen. And then two weeks became four weeks and then it became three months and then it kept going. And I think it was just like the disbelief that it was actually happening. And then with Hollywood, I was like, how are films and television shows going to come back? I couldn't understand how you would film a scene with extras or even a few actors. You know, I just the fact that they've been able to bring entertainment back and film it safely has been incredible. And they brought it back fairly quickly. I mean, if you guys were shooting in October, that's pretty good, you know, that they were able to get it back yeah. that quickly. I had oh. no idea how they were going to do it. Uh, I didn't either. In <laughs> fact, in Vancouver, I was like, there's no way. Yeah. There's no way. They're not really going to send us to Vancouver. No. We're going to get pushed to January. Right. Sure. Like, I was in shock when, yeah. <laughs> when I actually was traveling to Vancouver. I was like, oh, my God, wait, this is really happening. Yeah. Um, it was weird. And, you know, you're right. I remember at the beginning, it was this very strange and odd feeling like when the lockdown first happened I, maybe it was like the first or second weekend it was mm -hmm. like what are we doing yeah like, how long are we doing this oh it's just gonna be a couple months right like nobody had a clue no clue of anything and we were like the blind leading the blind <laughs> right it was it was it's so surreal. <laughs> it's so surreal. I can't believe it either. In a whole year? I know. Yeah. That's why and I think... Like, nuts. Yeah. No, but that's probably why when Passover came around again, you were probably like, again? Because it felt like we were still in March 2020. Like, we were stuck in time. It was wild. But what's really crazy, so let's talk about Superman and Lois. You had just gotten the role of Lana Lang on Superman and Lois right before the pandemic began. I remember it was, like, announced in Deadline and everything. And the show was originally just supposed to film from March to May. Like you guys thought that's when you were filming. And it was literally like the week of the lockdown that would have been when you were already there. So obviously that couldn't happen. Then it kept getting pushed, like you said. And now are you guys just going to, so you guys can't leave. So you're going to film season one straight through till, is it June or when is it? July? Yeah. So obviously, listen, the, the, None of us signed up to be here for that long. Yeah. I mean, remember to July? No, no, nobody thought it was going to be like that. But yeah. it is the pandemic. Um, right. So, yeah, we're aiming to do our 15 episodes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, listen, so far, so good. We've we've run into a couple of things, snags right. that's to be expected. Um, but, yeah, we're doing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I really, my cast, Brett, they're, they're such amazing humans and everybody is so dedicated and putting their best foot forward because as you know, it's been trying times. And I think like 
you know, and everybody has a different challenge. Like, it's so interesting. Like Tyler and Bitsy, who are Superman and Lois, you know, mm. they work nonstop. There is no break for them, you know? And so, and, and that's means. just intense. Mm -hmm. And then you have like us, you know, the supporting cast that sort of like dip in, dip out. And, but then, you know, as we talked about, we can't go really, we go for a walk. That's <laughs> like the thing. Oh, yes. Yeah sitting here waiting to work right and the, and the only thing that makes it worth it at all is like knowing that the show has just been so well received exactly huge you know, made something special and that i think in this universe feels um different than what people were expecting absolutely yeah I, I tuned in, you know, not knowing what to expect. And it's a whole new Superman story, you know, because we grew up with Superman. So, you know, we yeah. grew up with the Christopher Reeve movies. And then it became, uh, I think, uh, Lois and Clark was next with Terry Hatcher and Dean Cain. And that was yeah. kind of the new version of it, you know, where Lois took um, the center, you know, focus, focal point. And then uh, I guess Smallville was probably next with Tom Welling. And then the movies with Brandon Routh, and then the movies now, most recently with Henry Cavill. There have been so many, and they've always been so different. And now you wouldn't think that they could come up with another way to do it different, but Superman and Lois is completely different. You know, yeah. he's back in his town as a dad and a husband, and uh, he's got two kids, and you're his high school sweetheart who's now married to somebody else. He's now married to someone else. It's a dynamic we just haven't seen. We've never seen these characters go through this part of their life. It's totally. really cool. It's a totally yeah. different thing. So explain, I guess, explain to people how did um, how did the role come about for you? Because I'm sure you read a lot of pilot scripts, you know. So how did Lana Lang uh, come about? And then, you know, how is she different than any Lana Lang we've seen before? Um. So. Uh, okay. So let me go in order here. Yeah. So. Well, so it was. I guess then it would have been pilot season of 2020. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was uh, pretty much, um, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not, I'm not doing a pilot this year. And I'm actually really okay with that. Like, just cause I really had uh, my, my sight set on something very specific, Brett. Like I was really you know, I've been doing this for so long mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, I really want to do like my own show and I would love to do like a cable show mm -hmm. and, you know, just something that I can sink my teeth into and like, and really like come at it from the point of view as a woman. Because I think for a very long time, I still played like the, the sort of young girl, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of like entering this new, exciting phase in my career, but new. I mean, I'm yeah. like, oh, like what? Right. What I was out in the club like a year ago. Exactly. Well, <laughs> when I was watching it, the whole cast, I was like, how are, how do they have teenage kids? I was like, Emmanuel, <laughs> Tyler. I was like, how do they have teenage kids? I know, you, it's so cool. you have to but suspend your called, disbelief. It's the CW. That's how we have Exactly. It. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and so anyway, so I was like, okay with it because I was like, uh, focused. Right. And uh, I was down in Venice with some friends have is spending a beautiful Saturday afternoon. And my team calls me and they're like, Hey, we have um, something really interesting. And I was like, what's that? They're like, well, you have an offer. And I was like, huh? An offer for what? You're like a television show. Okay. What is it? Superman and Lois um, on the CW. And I started laughing. I was like, okay, guys, <laughs> that, that's funny, you know, because in my head, I was like, there is a certain stigma. Right. Right. About like a superhero show on the CW. It's not like it's the, title role like what's it gonna be like i don't know there was a stigma i'm a freaking snob let's just call it <laughs> i was like a cable baby i mean i grew up on entourage I HBO, did, yeah. you know what i mean like and i did whatever i have been spoiled 
Right. So initially I was like, <laughs> that's what's funny. And they're like, no, it's actually a really good script. So let's all take a read and let's reconvene. And I was like, okay, cool. Okay. So I read the script and Brett, it was so compelling. I thought so too, watching it. Yeah. What? Wait, what is this? What is this version of Superman and Lois? And like, Wait, and we're dealing with teenage kids that are dealing with like mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Hello, we spent the first twenty minutes talking about mental health, like right, all of these things in creating this world that was so uh, rooted and grounded in reality yeah. with this like, sprinkle of superhero. Mm-hmm. That's dope. Yeah. So, the creator, Todd Helbing, who is, without a doubt, one of the greatest humans that I've ever met in our business. I like that. Ever. He, um, we sat down and we talked about it and he wrote me a letter that if ever I'm having a really bad self-esteem day, I will go back and read that letter. Nice. He just really had it in his head that he really envisioned Lana Lang as me. He just, it's what he wanted. It's what he envisioned. He, you know, and then we we talked about it and I loved his creative vision so much and I loved him as a person. And it was just sort of one of those moments, Brett, where you just go, okay, this isn't, this isn't at all what I saw or planned for myself, but it just feels like everything is moving in that way. It's so nice. And I'm just going to I'm just going to challenge myself to stay open because I think that oftentimes where we stumble is our preconceived notions about things, you know, our judgments about things and 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 we talk our way in into something we talk our way out of things and and it was just sort of like one of those moments of like i needed to check myself it was just like stop with the ego shit this is a such an honor um b brett i've never been offered a television show before well that's what i was gonna say no never I was going to say, like, it's so different. You know, if you had gotten the audition, maybe you wouldn't have gone out for the audition. You would have said, I'm not auditioning for that. No, and then, like, stood in my own way. But because it was an offer, it it just, it changes it. You knew that you were the vision. And it changes it, too. I'll tell you why it changes it. It changes it because I felt so seen Mm -hmm. by Todd. So like a woman in an industry that I've been doing like since I was a kid. Yep. um, And I have lofty goals and I still have goals and there's so much that I want to do and I'm in for like the long haul, you know? As you know, the journey is long and it's complicated. It's exciting. It's gut wrenching. It's 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 all of the things. Oh yeah. Um, in my sort of creative journey, I've been frustrated a lot more Mm -hmm. than I want to be. Um, the thought that there was somebody who was seeing me for specifically what I could bring. Yeah. Uh, it was really it was really an honor. It was really quite a powerful feeling. Um, I love that. Yeah, it really was. It was so cool. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that experience. And, and so that was sort of, so then I was like, yeah, you know what? Let's see what happens. Let's do this. Yeah. And it was already picked up to series, right? It wasn't like you had to do a pilot and see if it got picked up, right? Well, it got picked up to series sort of after the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I mean, what are we going to do? Like shoot the pilot and send everybody. <laughs> right, right. So then, it, so then it was like straight to series, which is also really cool. So. How cool. And, yeah, 
that's just sort, of, sort of like how it was. And I mean, sorry, that was a super long winded answer. No, I, lo I love that answer because I think people need to understand, you know, I have so many friends who are actors and that process of auditioning and really wanting something and losing it to somebody else and just but then sometimes they go in for something they didn't want and that's the one they book and then they're so glad they got it and maybe they got it because they weren't caring so much about it so they went in and just kind of did it and threw it away and then nailed it it's fascinating i think it's fascinating <laughs> we all have our stories like oh, yeah. a million that literally don't make sense and you're just like okay well there's some things that you're meant to do and there's like some things. Exactly. That and that's why I do this podcast too, because I like to get everybody's stories of how they made it and the behind the scenes stuff. And I'm telling you, there were so many stories. If you go back and listen to old episodes where someone was like, I was about to quit and I said, I'd do one more audition. And that was the show that changed their life. It's wild. I can't Ooh. believe it. And like they remember the car ride home, feeling like they blew it and getting the call. And then they were on a show for 10 seasons or whatever it is, you know, um, it's wild. It's, it is. It's so crazy. So that's why it's almost like when, you know, you meet with him and he tells you it's a vision. How can you say no to that? You know, that's like what actors aspire to is a role written for them, you know. Let's say and also to, you know, like the lead. Like, I just remember the meeting and I was just like, God, I hope that he speaks to my creative soul. Yeah. I really hope that I genuinely jive with what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Because if I do, then then this is a no brainer, you know? Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot, listen, there was a lot of decisions. I mean, like Vancouver, you know, I've shot here before. I don't love being here. I'm a very sunshine person and it's yeah. not sunshine, but it's hard for me. Mm -hmm. so, there was like a lot of things but like i said all things kept pointing in that way amazing and, um and like honestly my cast is just so incredible yeah. i feel like the luckiest like yeah. really i feel so fortunate so so that was that and i think as far as lana lang you know Man. the irony this is the second time by the way that this has happened to me because you're gonna laugh this is okay. perfect for this yeah have uttered so many times superhero world that that's like not for me that's like not <laughs> go to it's like not they'll never they would never want me as the superhero you know in that world mm -hmm. cut to superman and lois and i get to play like the iconic role of lana lang oh totally. really okay cool the last time I said that is I was like, oh no, I'm like not funny. And like, I, no, I don't do comedy. Like I would never end up in a film with Adam Sandler. That's hilarious. Cut to. So, with, so I'm just going to start saying like, I got to do the reverse psychology. I was about to say it's reverse <laughs> psychology. And then just <laughs> as if. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you say they would never want me for that. Boom. Then you get it. That's cool. But how, so how did he pitch the character to you? How, what made her different? Cause she has some, you know, in the first five episodes, we learn that she's got some issues of her own that she's dealing yeah. with. You know, yeah. she's, she's a real person in a superhero world, you know? Real person. And that was, that was part of the pitch. It yeah. was like Lana Lang was somebody who uh, uh, the audience was really going to be able to relate to. Mm -hmm. She lives in this small town, you know, at this time also too, like, you know, the the writers are being so great about uh, writing all these timely issues Yeah, about businesses going under, dying cities, you know, all of these things. And so, you know, Todd's sort of vision of Lana was that she is like very relatable and that she sort of has, you know, demons of her own. Um, and, you know, Brett, general, like sort of for myself, I mean, I knew after the announcement, I was like, oh, Lord, have mercy. I was like, I'm going to be compared to, bless her heart, Kristen Crook, from here to the cows come home. And oh, like, yeah. yeah, she was such a, like a success. And I was like, oh. Really, this is going to happen. <laughs> and I and I just thought to myself, like, well, you know, 
I don't like to over research, meaning I don't, I didn't need to watch Smallville to inform me who Lana Lang was. Right. I didn't have to go back to all the comic books because I feel like then, then, then you sort of are in this, I mean, dangerous is a strong word, but you're in this place of like imitating. Right. I don't want to imitate. I want it to be authentic. I want to figure out who she is based on some mythology. Right. But also what the script is offering me. Right. What relationships are offering me. And like in my conversation with Todd, I knew that Lana was somebody who was real. She was a banker. She yeah. Lives, lives in Smallville. She, I, I kind of figured out what my backstory with Clark Kent was and how Kyle Cushing came into my life. And the rest sort of just feeds itself, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think whatever makes it different is not a lot of my doing. It's really about the writing. It's about mm -hmm they're writing her and where they're focusing you know different stories yeah and it's a greg berlanti show and he's got i think at last count 18 shows on the air which is just I me mean, he's um, the king of television unheard of i mean yeah I, I think this might be 19 actually superman and lois might be number 19 i don't know he breaks his own record every season but um yeah something about his shows their their dramas where the people just happen to be superheroes, I think, you know? Ah. So at the end of the day, it's like a, a family drama, an adult drama, whatever it is, teen drama. Oh. But one of the characters or more happen to have some sort of, you know, Super superpower. Hero. Well, you know, yeah. um, so Todd helping, you know, mm -hmm. he was the showrunner for, um, he created The Flash. Right. And so another- Part of the universe, yeah totally part of the universe but what was interesting is in my sit down with Todd was that he wanted it to be different oh, okay. like loved and celebrated the flash but but his whole thing you know and I think it's the thing that you're asking and I think it's the thing specifically that people are really liking about Superman and Lois is that he wanted it to be this feel of like a Friday Night Lights yes with the superhero elements. That's a great, I, I didn't think of that, but you nailed it. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, uh, that's him, that was him. No, uh, but but you oh, you said it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I, I didn't articulate it. But yes, it's Friday Night Lights, that kind of small town drama world, but it yeah. just happens to be one of the residents is Superman, you know? Yeah. And so also too, that was also like a big selling point to me. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's the story, Morning Glory. It. Yeah, well, let's talk about the rest of your cast. Uh, so Superman slash Clark Kent is played by Tyler Hoechlin. He's a friend of mine. I've got to have him on here, yeah, to talk about the show. But he he originated the role on Supergirl, and then they spun it off into his own show. And Lois Lane is Bitsy Tulloch, and she also played it on Supergirl. They gave them their own show. Uh, Lois's dad, Sam Lane, is played by Dylan Walsh. I was a big Nip Tuck fan, so I've watched Dylan Walsh for a long time. Uh, uh, Lana Lang's husband, Kyle Cushing, is Eric Valdez. That's your husband on the show. You have two daughters. Clark has two sons. I can see something's going to happen with that. Uh, but yeah, talk about the cast. How awesome is it to be part of that cast? Because everyone's so good in their role. Everybody's so good. I mean, the casting, they just, they nailed it. I am blown away blown away like i watched the show and i'm like who else would play superman and lois <laughs> right like, so perfect it's crazy yeah it's really good I embody it in this way is it makes me so happy and i'm again like i'm just really proud of everybody um my my daughter indy navarette right. she is phenomenal i mean that i get to do the kind of deep work that we've gotten to do together. Yeah, that's cool. Ugh, oh, it's been like so amazing. She's such a talent. All the kids are, they're incredible. All yeah. of them, the 
sons that everybody everybody's so good and then um you know we also have um Sophia Hasmick, who plays uh, Chrissy Beppo, which is, right. right, who's awesome and brings like a whole different feel. And then um, right. Rainer, who plays Morgan Edge. Right. Awesome. This yeah. That like comes in and just brings like another flavor. Right. And these are all the comic book characters from the original comic books, like going way back. Yeah. And then like Wole Parks who's playing um, uh, Lex Luthor. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, it's so, <laughs> it's, and it's so cool, too, because you really go, wow, for a superhero world, boy, we went against type in yeah. a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, because we've seen Lex Luthor forever, you know, and, like, they changed it up. And also it takes place today, you know, like this is a new version. And that's why it doesn't even matter really what came before. Like you were mentioning uh, Lana Lang on Smallville. This isn't a continuation of Smallville. Smallville was just a different interpretation. The shows really have nothing to do with each other, you know, yeah, yeah. just different versions. Um, you mentioned that the casting, was it David Rappaport? Did he cast? Yeah. So David Rappaport, I met when I first started throwing parties, a mutual friend called me and said like, David Rappaport wants to have a one year anniversary or two year anniversary for his casting company. And he had done Gossip Girl and he had done the movie Prom Night. So I was like, sure, I'll help him throw a, an anniversary party. And he was like this up and coming guy who did Gossip Girl, which was obviously incredibly cast. <laughs> and, and then he became Greg Berlanti's guy. And I think he does all, if not most of his shows. So whenever, oh whenever i see it like when i saw the article about you getting superman and lois i knew i was like david rapaport he was involved with that he yes. he's made a lot of my friends you know very successful by putting them in shows gosh bless him thank yeah. you david rapaport <laughs> yeah and he never runs out of people it's amazing every time there's a show he finds another star it's unbelievable you know oh, that's Cool. Yeah, he does a great job. So now five episodes have aired of your show with many more to come. They took a break because of the pandemic, right? Like they had to catch up. We had to catch up because we, we, we went to air and then yeah. really we were like, uh, we need to go dark for seven weeks. Right. So we catch up so we can like film and have it edited and, you know, do all the stuff. Yeah. So, so that's what's happening right now. So it's coming uh, back May 18th, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Tuesday night. So yeah, that gives people plenty of time to binge the first five. <laughs> in, into it, get excited, come yeah. back. <laughs> and you'll be ready. Yeah. So how did that feel when you got the news that after one episode airing, they renewed it for season two? <laughs> Easy. Crazy. I don't what? think that's ever happened before. I've heard it happen after a few, but never after one episode. Yeah, no, it was like it's like other level it's like it's like this that doesn't really happen no. generally everybody's always like waiting with face <laughs> breath and so like the, the last possible moment they tell right. you right um, but you know so just once again it's just like it's a testament to um doing something different and doing something special yeah and i guess when that happened was that kind of like a a wink to you from the universe like you made the right decision taking the offer. Yeah, it was <laughs> definitely was. You know, I think in it. Listen, it again. It's 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 crazy because then, you know, human nature panic sets in, and I'm just like, oh my god, but like, what, uh, what does that mean? And like, what if the borders don't open, and we're gonna have right. to go again? Do you know, so you go from like a super high. So mm -hmm. it's like super panicked of like, what does that mean? Right. Um, and we don't know. We actually no. don't know what that means. Right. And I'm, I'm being positive and having faith that like the borders will reopen and that we'll get to experience this second season the way we're meant to. Right, exactly. Like you get a week, you can go to LA. Exactly. And like, that's the be that's the beauty of shooting in Vancouver, <laughs> right? As being on the East Coast, you know what I mean? Like, awesome, so easy. Jump right. on a flight, go. So that's a uh, 
to be continued. Okay, that's good to know. And didn't they, I had heard that they built like a whole, Smallville is like a whole town they built to be safe, right? Outside of Vancouver. It's like literally they built a town just for the show. Built a town. It's Un- there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We have our, our, our house. So the can't, so there's the Kent farmhouse. We have all the interiors on stage. Um, we have the Cushing house and we have all the interiors on stage. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's, it's built. It's built. <laughs> to be here for a while we'll okay see. yeah you never know you never know what the cw supernatural was 15 seasons I mean, seriously. <laughs> no. right you could be employed on that show for a long time um so i want to mention just a little bit about the storyline uh you and clark reunite for the first time in a while at his mother's funeral that's what brings him back to town and by the end they decide they're going to stay in his mother's house and you know that they're going to live in smallville again so that's a cool dynamic and so obviously there's tension between you and clark because you were high school boyfriend and girlfriend and there's tension between your husband and clark because you were together in high school but that creates a very cool dynamic because no one's rooting for alana to come between superman and lois it's not like you know it's not like those shows where you know will they or won't they it's not like that it's just a history and i think it's an interesting uh, dynamic because in real life there are people who have a relationship break up but stay friends so i think it's a cool thing to explore where you're really just going to stay friends you know absolutely and that and by the way i mean not for nothing that's the story of my life i'm like (laughs) great friends with all my ex-boyfriends like great friends yeah that's true so I and I'm so happy for that. Um, I think you no, met one of them at one of my birthday parties. Is that true? Did you meet someone at my birthday party? That's right. So I I take credit for that. <laughs> well, that. That's crazy. Right? Yes, we spent five years together. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, and you're right. And you know, Brett, to your point. Um, What's really cool about that is that, you know, Bitsy was once telling me that she had had a conversation, you know, with Todd about just the importance of like not turning Lana and Lois against each other. Exactly. Like women, we're not teenagers. Right. It's like we're in this shit together. Yeah. Like, let's not go there. That's 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 really cool. It's so cool. And and so they've really have been like, you know, writing towards that. And you'll see in in the newer episodes, like there is, it's just like they really have like a a, a friendship that's sort of blossoming and deepening as the season goes on. I like that a lot. Yeah, that really stuck out to me that it wasn't going to be the kind of show where like you were there to mess things up. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like I said, everyone has time to catch up on the first five episodes before it comes back May 18th. So now this is where it's going to become like inside the actor studio where we're going to go back to the beginning and find out how you got your start. So first, tell everybody where you're originally from. Born in Montreal, raised in Toronto. So Canada. Canada. Canadian girl. It's a, Yeah, I was going to. I became... I became an American three years ago. Oh, that's right. On Rosh Hashanah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Happy New Year to me. Happy New uh, Year. I, yeah, I, after living in the States forever. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm dual citizen. Yeah. And, um, but I was born in Montreal, raised in Toronto, and- Now you're in left- Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps calling you back. Yeah. Back fan. Um, and then I, I, yes. Yeah. Well, I always, I, yeah, I find Canadians are always so nice. When I meet people and they're extraordinarily nice, they're either usually Canadian or Australian. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Take it out of your mouth. I know. Yeah. I like, we have a, listen, we're both part of the British Commonwealth and there's something about that. Something they're about both- that. Giant beer drinkers. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> it's an Aussies. They yeah. love the beer. They yeah. love a good time. There's a real zest for life. Yeah. That's good traits. <laughs> yeah. So, what age? What age do you remember first wanting to be an actress when you grow up? What's your earliest memory of that? Oh my God. 
And like, you won't even believe me. Like, I think when I was like three or four. I believe you. I wanted to, I wanted to make movies when I was four, so I believe you. <laughs> oh, oh my yeah. God, that's so much. It's so cute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just was a, I was kind of a bit of a ham as a child. And I got shyer as an adult. Oh, okay. Because, like so flashy in my life but as a kid I was just like Wah! yeah and I loved dancing and I love you know what I just loved entertaining the adults basically yep. and I uh uh and so I always knew like I used to just be really like sassy and be like I want to be an actor or a dancer or a painter or a singer and right. many I was going to do something in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Didn't know what. Right. And um, when I was seven uh, in elementary school, one of my friends, um, his name was Ty Johnson. His dad was the artistic director of the Unionville Theater Company. And he was like, you know, we're putting on this play. My dad's putting on this play. Do you want to come audition? You know, it's for the role of the baby ghost. And I was like, yeah. And like, I went and I auditioned and it was like this big deal. Like at the time, and my mom yeah. was helping me. It was this thing and I got the role. And it was like my first taste of um, the theater. And it was the first taste of... <laughs> what was going to become like a lifelong addiction of that feeling feeling that family that magic that like summer camp thing that mm -hmm. you can't put your finger on um and it was a game changer and I mean I literally came home and I was like dad you need to drive me to rehearsals and like I mean, I was done after that. Like you I found your calling at seven years old. Literally. That's at seven incredible. years old. I found my calling at seven. <laughs> and I used to do like community theater for years. And then when I was about um uh let's see. Well, my brother was sixteen and he's nine years older than me. So sixteen minus nine is what? Seven. Seven? What? Seven? No. Oh my god. Wait, 16 minus 9 is 7. 7? Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, did I get math wrong? I was like, my nephew and nieces are never going to trust me again with their homework. <laughs> uh, well, maybe he was 18 because I was about 9 years old. Okay, he was 18. <laughs> that would have been such easier from the get-go. Sorry. Wow. To be oh, my God. You scared me that I got it wrong. <laughs> so, he, my brother... Uh, uh, he put me through my first sort of like on camera acting classes. Oh, wow. And, uh, it was like this, like acting for commercials, you know, whatever, whatever. And, and, and it was like a lot of money. It was like $900 at the time, you know, it was a lot of money. And my brother, you like, my brother believes in his baby sister. That's it's like, I love like that. my brother was like, my baby sister needs to be in front of the camera. I love that he did that for you. I know. It's the best. It's the best. And, you know, Brett, well, side note, just because we're talking about my brother, but, you know, I, I'm i very close to my brother and my sister and um, my nieces and my nephews. And, uh, you know, uh, sadly, we lost our mom so young. Oh, and then lost my dad you know actually my god that was like right around your birthday where i met jer wow. i i think i lost my dad a few months before that oh wow yeah just full circle moment yeah, so i remember it so yeah so so you know so it was a crazy time and so like my brother and my sister now you know they're we I'll hold each other accountable and so we and they are in a in a way they're i don't do anything without running it by them right i'm the same yeah. way with my family. yeah yeah sure it's like it's like we, we do yeah. and um and it was really nice because you know now it's i think it's 
it's really cool to be able to say to my brother, like, yo, like, ser- like literally you supported me in the beginning. You started right. my career. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's amazing, too. If you look at your credits, because your credits start in 1995. And if you look, you've got 42 movies and 42 TV shows. I happened oh, to be it? looking and I was like, wow, it's the same number of, t- and that's just titles, not episodes. I mean, if you do episodes, it's way more, but just oh. titles alone, 42 different movies and 42 different TV shows. Yeah. Wow. Oh, and that's really? just IMDb. That's probably more. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's so crazy. I know. I was like, how am I going to narrow it down to know what to talk to her about today? Because <laughs> there's so much. Um, but you were a professional actor starting in 1995, right? Yeah. So was- you're in your 26th year now as a professional actor. That's amazing. Um, I know. I'm so blessed. So, so how did it start? You moved to Vancouver. Is that how it really began? So I, okay, so long story short, yeah. acting, community theater, blah, 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 auditioned for um, theater school because there was one opening where I lived in Unionville. Oh, wow. Totally fate, meant to be <laughs> great program called the Arts York program, hard to get into. Yeah. It was I had to get in. I love it. Or I was going to die. That yeah, I, but that's what, that's how you have to be in this business. It, it, that's it. That's okay. it. Yeah. Only way. So if you have a fallback, right, you fall on it. Like, that's I, just what David Mamet always said in his book. Um, you know, true, 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 truth or true or false. Uh, yeah. Something like that. He literally, like in the first few pages, is like, as an actor, your entire life, people are going to ask you, okay, but what if it doesn't work out? And if you have a backup, then you will end on your backup plan. Yeah. And by the way, it's not just acting. It's writing and directing, too. Your whole life. (laughs) All our business. (laughs) Yeah. People always say, but what are you really going to do? And you're just like, would you ask a doctor? What are you really going to do? (laughs) Messed up, actually. Exactly. so anyway, so then I uh, went to high school for the performing arts. And when I was 16, I got um, my first gig, which was called The Right Stuff. It was my first professional gig on YTV, which is a Canadian, kind of like Nickelodeon. Oh, yeah. And from that, I got my agent and then sort of did like, a bazillion commercials and like little bit parts like one line here two lines there like a couple of days here a couple of days there guest star and then um <laughs> and then in my early 20s i guess i was gosh i don't even remember the order of this anymore but it was definitely in my early 20s my my brother and his wife had moved to vancouver and I had left theater school. So I went to a theater school uh, called um, George Brown, which is another uh, prestigious school in Toronto. And I dropped out after the first year because I was like, this is amazing, but this isn't for me. Like this was, it was for, and I don't mean it wasn't for me because we all stand to learn. I did so much workshops and like I did a workshop with Uta Hagen, like, right that you know i just mean that that program very much felt like if you wanted a life in the theater mm. and i really wanted to go and make movies yeah that, i wanted to make movies that was it wasn't even thinking about tv it was like, <laughs> and then um so i left and then and then i moved out to vancouver and you know waitress all over the place uh worked quite a bit in vancouver and i Bopped around, right? I was like nomadic. I went like Vancouver. I was in New York. I was back in Toronto, trying to figure out how do I get to the states. This was like this was like the bane of my existence in the twenties. How do I get to the states? I oh, have wow. to get to the states. I have to get. <laughs> to it was like I have to get there. How do I do this? And it was hell, but I got there. You got there. And uh, I thought I was going to be based in New York. Um, and then I had done this film called uh, Detroit Rock City. Yep. That was next on my list. That was next on your list? 1999. That was 1999. And uh, I went, I came to LA for the premiere of Detroit Rock City and um, stayed. 
Wow. Like, I bounced. Yeah. And there's a lot of drama in the, <laughs> years, like, five years from that to, like, 2003 were, like, mm-hmm. the hardest years of my life in the business. Mm-hmm. But I got to the States. I love that. And then you were. And so um, I remember learning your name for the first time when I was in college. Uh, I remember my senior year of college, a movie came out uh, with Lance Bass called On the Line. And it was promoted like crazy because MTV, this is the height of NSYNC, the height of TRL. And I remember learning the name Emmanuel Shrieky, which was also like a unique name, you know, (laughs) that I had never heard before. But, you know, hearing it for the first time, I remember in, you know, connection with that movie. And it was 2001, and it was just such a big deal in pop culture because In Sync was on the soundtrack, and Britney Spears was on it, and Mandy Moore. I mean, it was just a pop culture moment. So for you, as someone who only wanted to get to the states, it must have been surreal that you were part of such like an American pop culture movie, right? Surreal. <laughs> surreal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. And that was, you know, also too specifically one of the moments is that you know i i right before booking on the line yeah um, which which goes to what you were saying before um i had called my father in toronto in tears beside myself i was so i had no, I had no money i was like living at friends places i was fucking done mm. it's just like crying like daddy i can't do this anymore i i'm gonna come home i just i miss you i can't this is too hard like i just i don't want to do this anymore and um and i remember i had a dream like maybe the day after i spoke to my dad maybe two days after it's really nuts what i'm about to tell you and in my dream my mom came to me in my dream and she had these like big angel wings and she came and she was like doing this to my head. And the feeling was everything is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And and daddy on the phone, who, let me just say, daddy notoriously was like, why don't you uh, go to college and, you know, become a doctor I'm yeah like, who are you speaking to <laughs> <laughs> yeah what right so he was concerned i think for a long time and daddy of all people was the one who had said you're like always welcome to come home um of course but just hang in there like i believe in you uh and I got online. I love that. Like that week. Wow. Yeah. And that then dream. Like, I believe in that dream. For a year, you know, like that, right. like, oh my God, I can pay my rent for like a whole year here. <laughs> that's incredible. I mean, that I believe in that stuff. I believe in that dream that you had, that it was a visit, that it was exactly, I, before you even said it, I knew it was a sign that everything was going to be okay. But yeah, it's interesting that that's the movie that I remember hearing about you for the first time too, you know? And your co-stars in that movie were Lance Bass and Joey Fatone. And Lance is how I met you. So it all kind of... There we go. Full circle again. Full circle. Wait, I love that. And so then that movie gave you the confidence, I guess, to live in L.A. and live in the States and keep keep working. Keep working. Like, just keep going. And, you know, there was always these... There were always these, like, satellite moments in Mm -hmm. my career. Like, because even before on the line, you know, like, like, like the reason that I was a contender for on the line was because Lance was obsessed with the film, a hundred girls that I had done with Jonathan Tucker. Oh, wow. Or two. So he had seen that. He had seen it and loved it, was like obsessed with it. Um, And then, you know, and, and a hundred girls was one of those that, you know, was like, um, you know, prior to that, I had done Snow Day. Right. And Snow Day came along where I was still one foot in Canada, one foot in the States, and short interlude, Snow Day happens. Brett, I had quit the business, like 
straight up quit the business. Wow. I like called my manager at the time and I was like, I am on a sabbatical. Do not call me. I, I was done. I was like, I'm not cut out for this shit. <laughs> I was like, for sure. I am not cut out for this. This is brutal. Yeah. Um, I had moved back to Toronto with my boyfriend at the time. I had gone to therapy. I went to this therapist that specialized in working with performers. And I like told her my story and I said, I'd gone to her. I was like, look, I'm done with my career. I guess I just need to work this out with you. I'm like my early twenties. I was learning, um, uh, martial arts. I was like, I was like on some trip that I was like, nobody speak to me about this business wow so i came to the end of this therapy oh, right. her, and she had said and i was convinced i was like waiting praying for her to say time for you to move on i agree this isn't good for you and instead she says to me it's very clear to me that you're meant to be <laughs> doing this amazing <laughs> what like, wait, wait, what do you mean no i don't want to do this this is killing me she was right and <laughs> so crazy so the and the next audition that i got was snow day oh wow that i turned down the audition like five times i was like nope i'm not i'm not ready yet i'm like, like who am i wait, but nope. that's that's been the running theme. The running theme has been when you say you don't want it or you're not going to get it, that's that's the next thing. Wow. I didn't even know that that's true. That's actually crazy. That's, that's but crazy. I guess. So I ended up doing Snow Day. So that was another yeah. sad moment, which really brought me, helped me get me to the States. Amazing. So that's it. That's it. No, that's it. I love that. And I think, you know, so far the therapist was right. Your parents were right. Your brother was right. Uh, you know, that's something that, and I feel like it all kind of led up to that moment of getting that letter from the creator of Superman and Lois being like, this is for you. It all kind of led up to that. It's a, this is an interesting time to be kind of talking to you about your entire career because it's leading up to where you are right now. Yeah. Which it is really cool. Yeah. Um, so after uh, On the Line, now you were a known actress and you were working and you were in the States. You did a movie... It yeah, you know, yeah. ish. But uh, I knew who you were. That's what's important. But uh, in 2003, you did a movie called Wrong Turn, which was like, this was when like, there was like so many horror remakes and it was part of that. And it was, you know, another pop culture moment. It was you and Eliza Dushku, Desmond Harrington, Jeremy Sisto, Kevin Zegers, Lindy Booth. And that was like a big movie. And like, they've made six of them and they rebooted it last year. <laughs> the reboot killed me. I was like, oh my God, I'm officially old. <laughs> <laughs> no, but now they reboot things very quickly. I mean, that was, that was 15, 20 years they rebooted it. But um, what was it like to be part of that? Did you feel like this is kind of, you know, you were working with people, you know, a group of young actors all your age in the horror genre, you know, everyone kind of does their horror movie when they're starting out. Was that yeah. like a big moment for you? I suppose that it was. You know, Brett, the crazy thing is that every time <laughs> it never feels like the big moment. Yeah. Because hustling so hard. Mm -hmm. Just like, oh my God. Like, oh my God, I can't get a job. This is great. Like, great cast. This is going to be cool. Okay, awesome. Yeah. It never feels like, and then you have to protect yourself because then when you think it is the moment mm -hmm. like god forbid you think it's actually the moment yeah and then it blows up in your face well I, one thing i do notice is that it's hard to kind of um when you work on a project by the time the world sees it you're working on the next thing already and sure. so people are talking to you about the last thing and it's hard for you to kind of i don't i don't know like you're already on to the next thing. So, but, okay. but you have to get yourself into a mindset when you're, where you're celebrating the thing that the public is currently consuming that you're a part yeah. of. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> so yep. even if you've mentally gone on to your next project or what am I going to do next? You have to kind of step out of it and be like, let's celebrate the one that's out right now that people are exactly. talking exactly. about. 
So I think that's what you mean, that it never feels like the moment. Um, yeah. But 2005, let's talk about that, because that was a big year for you. You had a bunch of movies and a massive TV show that did make you very known. So 2005, you did the first you did the movie Waiting with uh, Dane Cook, who was on the podcast. We talked about that movie, but it was Dane, Ryan Reynolds, Justin Long, Anna Faris, this comedy cast. Uh, what was that like being part of a comedy like that? Oh my God, it was so fun. But you know what, Brett? It was so, it's so crazy. <laughs> when we were shooting in New Orleans, okay? Yeah. Like, all of us were, we weren't who we are today. Right. Like, Brian Reynolds was not Brian Reynolds yet. Right. He was like kind of comedy dude. Like, he had a name, but like, he wasn't the movie star. Wait, he was on a sitcom, remember? Two guys, a girl, and a pizza place. Yeah, remember that? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And like, same with Anna, same with Justin. Yeah. You know, he was like just starting. So, again, it was sort of one of those moments. You know, I remember at the time, like the fact that we had um, Louis Guzman in it was right. like, oh, you know, like, whoa, that's so cool. Yeah. But like, all the rest of us, we were just like like kids in New Orleans making this silly, hilarious movie. And I guess we would be like, what, up and comers, so to speak. But like, yeah. it again, it just didn't feel like it. Yeah, that goes back to what you were saying about camp, the camp feeling. Yeah, it was such a camp feel. It yeah. was really fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, also 2005, you did In the Mix, which I remember was a big deal because you were like the star of that with us. And it was you, Usher, and Chaz, Chaz Palminteri, who I loved from like A Bronx Tale and everything. It was yeah. one of Kevin Hart's first movies. I mean, people yeah. didn't know Kevin Hart back then. And also your fiance in the movie was Jeff Stoltz, who's been on the podcast. And he he was your fiance, Chaz Palminteri was your dad, but you and Usher fall in love and in the yeah. mix. And yeah. you know, trouble ensues from that point on. But yeah. um, what was it like being part of that movie? That looked like fun too. It was so fun. It was so fun. That was a really cool moment, that movie. I remember very well. Yeah. Um, Barbara Fiorentino cast it. And um, I just love her so much. And uh, it just was amazing. Usher was the best. We had the best time. And also, too, well, you'll see, because if you looked at my resume at all you'll see that most times where there seems to be a singer some kind of pop star yep, right <laughs> I'm somehow affiliated <laughs> right yep on the line and in the mix are kind of in the same family right there online mix cadillac records I yes think we'll we get to that right yep. it's just every time there's a music i'm like oh i'm meant to do that <laughs> i like that that's cool that's cool. <laughs> um yeah so that was a really cool cool moment yeah for sure. and then something major happens in 2005 you join the cast of entourage a massive hit show on hbo i loved it it premiered in july 2004 it was a big hit right away created by doug ellen produced by mark Wahlberg. it was loosely based on mark Wahlberg's life as the movie star with his entourage it went on to air for eight very successful seasons on hbo you joined in season two in 2005. You got to already join, you know, an established show knowing it was a hit, which is cool. And yeah. your first episode was actually called The Bat Mitzvah. <laughs> Fittingly <laughs> enough for a Jewish girl to start on an episode with called The Bat Mitzvah. So tell me about getting the role. Was that just another audition and you booked that role? Yeah, that was a crazy audition. That was actually a crazy audition. Tell me um, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it quickly. I auditioned once, twice, had a callback. Connolly was like, I, I want her. And nice. um, we, I didn't know Connolly. And I knew the whole crew Leo, Toby, Eustace, Damon. Right. The whole crew, but I never knew Connolly. So, uh, he got permission to call me to be like, for the test, do exactly what you did. I was like, okay. And then I didn't hear anything for like two weeks. 
And, oh, and I was going crazy. And again, you know how it is. It's like all the ebbs and flows. <laughs> I was, oh my God, am I ever going to work again? And like waiting for the phone to ring and two weeks goes by. And I'm like, fuck it. This is not happening. This is not happening. And then um, one day I was talking to Jenna on the phone. Um, you know, beep. Hold on. Hold on, babe. Hello. Emmanuel, uh, this is Kevin Connolly. I was like, hi, listen, I, I got permission to call you to tell you that you got the part. And I'm like, what? Amazing. Amazing. She's like, you should come out with your girls. Like, let's go celebrate. You know, went to whatever club it was. I can't remember, like, pray or something. Yeah, that sounds and, right. All right, that sounds right. <laughs> and, um, but you know, you know the story about this, right? No, I don't. I'm really asking. Oh, it was a three episode arc. Ah. That Cons had said this could really become something. So, like, whatever you need, like, you want to rehearse, you want to run lines, like, da 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 da. I love that he so, was so supportive, like, in the process. My angel. Yeah. Is my guardian angel in this business. He knows it. His, his, Baby mama, dear friend Zulai yeah. knows this is anybody who knows us knows that. Like, Monalee mm -hmm. has been an angel in my life. And um, he really, like, t literally took me under his wing. And it became like three episodes turned into six seasons of the show. Yeah. And the movie. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Like, Game changer. Game changer. Yeah, that's the one. That's the big break, I guess you could say. And <laughs> yeah. but you know, the Entourage cast was very guy heavy season one. It needed a strong female character to be part of the cast. And I feel like Sloan not only became that character, but she became like the heart of the show. You needed Sloan, don't you think? I mean, it's 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 it's, it's weird to say. I mean, listen. No, she's the heart of it. Well, you can look at it as the character. I can't. It was yeah. such a Real heavy show, yeah. And the way that Doug wrote, like the women on the show were really strong. Like we're talking Constant Zimmer, Carlo Gugino, right, right, right. Know, Reeves, like all of the women that he had, they were like strong women. I think the thing was that Sloan, which was so fun, is the really the only one who got to mingle with all the boys. The group. I was going to say that girl. She was part of the entourage, right? Like Perry Reeves was married to Ari Gold. Always had like the kid. They, she was in the house. She was wherever she was, right? Right. But alone, I got so many moments with the boys. Right. So I think I think subconsciously people just were like, "Oh, that was," you know, she was one of the. She was one of the entourage. Yeah, Sloane is because Sloane got to be wherever E was, and E was always with the entourage. So <laughs> that's how yeah. that worked. Let's talk about that cast. So Adrian Grenier played Vinny Chase. Uh, he's the Mark Wahlberg character. Kevin Connolly played E, who's Vinny's manager and Sloane's love interest. Kevin Dillon played Johnny Drama. He's Vinny's brother, who's also an actor. He's also Matt Dillon's brother in real life. So that's pretty genius casting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jerry Ferrara played Turtle, who's Vinny's friend slash driver slash assistant uh i remember at one point i had like four goldfish and i named them Vinny e drama <laughs> and turtle i had a fish <laughs> named turtle uh and then of course jeremy piven as ari gold who's Vinny's agent <laughs> and i've known jeremy since like the hyde days so like 2005 um yeah. and it was very cool to watch him win awards i mean he won three yeah. emmys in a row for that show 2006 2007 2008 yeah so we'll talk about that cast i mean that's got to be like a family to you right bros <laughs> to, the end, to the end like really like to the end you know last year well no right before the pandemic actually started we kevin dylan kevin connelly myself and adrian grenier we went to saudi arabia for comic-con I remember you posting about that, right? Right? I mean, after all these years, like what, we were thick as thieves. It was 
so amazing. And it was just like a reminder. And, you know, I do, I go on the podcast quite often, the victory podcast. Yeah. Um, and like, it's a whole chapter in my life, Brett. Oh, yeah. Like it's, it will continue for ever. Like that was a moment in time. It was a moment in time. It was a moment in time in the TV industry. Yes. It was, it was a moment in time. It was pre-social media. Yeah. It was so like this really special moment in time. And yes. like, it, there's just nothing like it, you know? Like, I, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've said to Doug, thank you, thank you. This was like the most epic chapter of my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been a lot of talk. I guess people spent the quarantine binging the eight seasons either again or if they had yeah. never seen it. And yeah. so there's been a lot of talk as recently as like yesterday of a reboot. People yeah. are like wanting, have, have there been, first of all, you would do a reboot, right? If the opportunity. Percent. What? That's I would do it a million percent. <laughs> right. And but, so have there been serious discussions, do you know, between Doug Ellen and HBO about possibly doing a reboot? I don't think there's, I don't think it's gotten to that level. I think it's, I think it's, we know that there's an appetite for a reboot. We're fairly certain that if we were to do a reboot, it would be a freaking success. Yeah. Um, that much I know. Beyond yeah. that, I don't really know. But you're in if there's a reboot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And where do you think Sloan is now? Where do you think, what do you think she's doing? Oh, she had a few babies. I think they're living in New York. Oh, cool. So I think they're living in New York. And like, you know, I think her and E finally maybe figured it out. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they took us on a bit of a roller coaster ride, I would say. Uh, roller coaster. It's I remember. Real. I would read this <laughs> and be like, come on. Yeah, can't we just be happy? <laughs> I remember he moves in with Sloan around season three and, but he doesn't fully unpack all of his things and she gets upset and they end up breaking up. Um, <laughs> season six, they got engaged. Season seven, they planned a wedding. Season eight, they broke up, but got pregnant. And then in the movie, they had the baby. And as far as we know, they yeah. are still together. Um, An affair with my stepmother. Oh yeah. I mean, dude, really? Yeah. Only on HBO. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but you know what's funny is like you say it was a show of a moment. You're right, because I watched it religiously on Sunday nights. And that was back when, you know, for the kids out there, when we had like water cooler shows, you had to watch it the night it was on. You couldn't wait and binge it at the end of the season. No. You had to watch Entourage on Sunday night so that you could talk about it with everybody the next day. And you would have the DVD. Oh, the yeah. Season, if exactly. like... It, no, it was such a different time. It, it was right before everything changed, too. Right before everything changed. Yeah. Um, and I want to also add, the show was nominated for Best Comedy Series at the Emmys in 2007, 2008, 2009. It was always nominated in the writing and directing categories. Um, how did that feel to be part of a show that was not only such a hit and a pop culture phenomenon, but also critically acclaimed and winning awards? Because it's nice to have both. I mean, listen, it was the dream. It's why at the beginning of this, I said, like, I'm a bit of a spoiled kid. Yeah. You know, like, I'm spoiled. Like, I got to be a part of that thing that you're lucky if it happens once in your life. Right. And I was a part of that. Yeah. And epic. Like, it was epic epic because like I loved the show and I loved playing it and I loved you know I, I all of it it was really really cool it was I, really what dreams are made of yeah is Sloan still such a part of you because I feel like there's similarities between Emmanuel and Sloan like well I think so I mean yeah. I think that we're all pretty similar to our characters on that yeah. show I think yeah. that's why I think it's why it resonated so so deeply you know yeah. um but yeah, and I mean, God, it would be so fun to reprise that. Well, I think everyone's wondering where the characters are, and it's the kind of show you can pop back in at any time and check in on them. You know, it didn't have like such a final soprano yeah. ending. You know. Yeah, 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 exactly. 
it's left open ended. Do you have any favorite episodes or moments from from Entourage? Oh or scenes? God. There's too many. Too many. Uh, you know what? There was, there was, there was, there was, there was, there was a, um, a moment. I couldn't tell you what season it was. Maybe season three. Mm-hmm. It was my charity benefit that that uh, Vinny was auctioning some. It's whatever. We were at the Roosevelt Hotel, right? And I remember. It was summertime. We were shooting. We were all gussied up. And it was like end of day. And it was and like, I think like Jer, Jer, Kevin, and I, we went outside on Hollywood Boulevard. We were having a smoke. <laughs> and it was on Hollywood Boulevard. And it, the sun was setting. And it had this like pink glow. And we were like, you know, literally on the stars. And we were dressed to the nines and we were shooting the show. And it was literally this moment of like, oh my God, this isn't a dream. This is reality. Wow. Like it was this insane visual that I see, like the colors are so vibrant and the feeling of that like summer and the light and at the Roosevelt Hotel. It was just iconic. It was just like, what is happening right like, now? Like old Hollywood. Yeah. I it love was that. Amazing. Ah. But so when you see every day was a blast. Like every time we were on set, it was a blast. Yeah, yeah. what a great job. And yeah. there were always the guest stars were incredible. You know, Malcolm McDowell played your dad, Terrence, who was like the rival agent. Uh and just, you know, people were popping in every episode playing themselves. That's how you know you have a hit show when people want to come on and play themselves. And they're like pitching themselves. They're like dying to get on the Put show. On. Yeah. Did I ever tell you my entourage story or not? No. I don't know if we ever talked about this. I should have told you about this. So I was an assistant to a director uh, in 2006 and Doug Ellen wanted to write an episode where Johnny Drama goes to the director's house and pitches himself to be in one of his movies and Uh so we spent the day with doug allen like we went to lunch with him at the ivy he hung out with us at the house and he i could see the wheels turning he was like coming up with ideas for what to put in the episode and so he goes off he writes the episode and then i start getting emails from my actor friends saying their breakdowns went out and there's a role for the director's assistant based on you and i was like (laughs) what so i'm like i'm gonna be a character on entourage Oh so God. I get the sides, I get an acting coach, and I go audition for the role <laughs> yes. of the director's assistant, and I don't get it. <laughs> Jonathan Sadowski booked it, who's been on the podcast. So that's how we became friends. Oh so he and I go in depth on that story. So anyone who wants to hear that, listen to the Jonathan Sadowski episode. Oh but God. I didn't get the part of playing myself on Entourage. Now, in retrospect, I should have just gone to Doug Allen and said, can I play myself? We'll yeah. figure it out. I'll take whatever class I need to take. Yeah. But I tried to go through the proper channels of auditioning and I learned the hard way that it's tough to be an actor in Hollywood. Um, but I can always say there's a character on Entourage that was based oh, that, on you. That's actually pretty cool that you can say that. That's cool, right? I know. I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, I don't know if I've ever told Emmanuel this story. No, I uh, never knew. <laughs> so you, like you said, you're still friends with Doug Allen and the cast. You do the Victory podcast. And, you know, hopefully there will be a, a reboot of some yeah. kind. So Fingers cool. crossed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so while you were doing Entourage, you mentioned this too. You started in a big movie with Adam Sandler. You don't mess with the Zohan. You played Dahlia, who's the owner of a hair salon. Adam played the Zohan, who's a terrorist turned aspiring hairstylist, <laughs> which is a rare role. Uh, comedy ensues. The cast was you, Adam Sandler, John Turturro, Nick Swartzen. He's a friend of mine. He's hilarious. Uh I once walked into Earth Bar, actually, and he goes, if it isn't America's, always there, but he goes, if it isn't America's sweetheart, I was like, I'll take it as I walk into Earth Bar. Uh, Rob Schneider, Lainey Kazan, Kevin Nealon, Dave Matthews, who's my favorite musician. Um, It was directed by Dennis Dugan, who directed eight Adam Sandler movies, going back to Happy Gilmore. Tell me your Adam Sandler movie experience, because what a cool experience. It was bananas. <laughs> bananas. It was like another epic moment. Yes. Like a 
really another epic moment. Um, Did you laugh every day? Oh my God. <laughs> All day, every day. Like, yeah. You know, there is a misconception. Like, you know, Adam is a perfectionist. Yeah. Like, I'm moving on until you have the shot. So it's like, it's fun and the vibe is amazing, but nobody's fucking around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Which was amazing, actually, to see. Um, and it was a thrill. Like, wait, I was a... What? The female lead, yeah. It's even happening. <laughs> How yeah. is that happening? Yeah. It did. And somehow, my good fortune was that Selma Hayek got pregnant because she was supposed to do Dahlia. Oh, interesting. No, you're Dahlia. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, and uh, they kind of were like, I was shooting this movie in Vancouver, this like indie, and there was this, uh, I had a meeting, a general with Heather Perry. Oh yeah. Okay. At Happy Madison, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, at this general, Heather's like, I wanna introduce you to Dennis Dugan. I'm just, you might be really right for this film. We're like, we're on the lot, we're on the Sony lot. Yeah. So we meet Dugan, Dennis. God bless him. I love that man. Another like epic human being. I love that you love all these people that you've worked with. What a great experience. Oh no, I'm the luckiest. I barely have a shit story. Yeah, that's good. I am the luckiest in that regard. Like amazing people. I love it. So Dennis is like, well, when when can you come in? And I and I'm and I'm like, well, I'm actually like I'm I'm leaving, <laughs> shooting this film in Vancouver. I was like, I need, you know, to get a dialect coach to do the Palestinian accent. And I was like, in like 10 days. <laughs> right. Like, but realistically, like there was no way. <laughs> I'm not going to like, this is like my chance. I'm not going to yeah. like do it half ass. Right? right. So he was like, okay, cool. Like 10 days. And he's like, he's like, uh, did you introduce her to Sandler yet? It's such <laughs> a general meeting that I'm having with Heather Perry. I'm like, Psh. it just happened. So Sandler is on the lot playing basketball. And we like go and we visit. And he's so cool. And he's so chill the way Sandler is. And then like, um, I did my audition, it went really well. And then I did it again for Dennis in the room on tape and, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting. And um, I was back in Vancouver shooting the movie that I was doing. And um, one day I'm in my hotel room and I'm about to get picked up and I get a call on my cell phone Hi, uh, I have Ema I have Adam Sandler for Emmanuel Shriki. Yeah. What the fuck is happening right now? He's like, Emmanuel, it's Adam Sandler. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> He's like, I just want to let you know that, um, well, I think we're going to have a blast working together. So cool. <laughs> What? Literally, Brett, like I got off the phone. I was so overcome with emotion that I literally like, I was like so dramatic. I like, like fell to the floor in my hotel room. Like I just needed to sit down and I just like cried, like tears of joy. Those are the moments though. That's why you do it for those <laughs> moments. This was like so surreal. And then again, it was the second time where like the star calls me. Right. My team hadn't even told me I was getting the offer. Like that's a cool way to do it. I, I like this idea of have, having the co-star. It was so nice. That's a good. And idea. listen, the it was um it was epic. The shoot oh, yeah. was epic. The all of it. The producers. You know, there was a moment in time where I was shooting. It was a night shoot, and it was it was me. So absurd to even say out loud. It was me, John Turturro, 
Adam Sandler, Rob Schneider, Kevin Nealon, <laughs> like, uh, what, why am I, what? Saturday what? Night Live. And I think that that's the, like, the, st- the story of my life a little bit. I'm often in shock by, like, <laughs> no, but I know, I think that's important, though. I think you should never lose that kind of how did I get here feeling. <laughs> nice to have that, you know, to always remember the kid who wanted to do it when they grew up, you know? Yeah. So that's yeah. cool. Is that yeah. a yeah? Exactly. And is that a movie that because it made like hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office? Is that one that people come up to you and mention a lot or quote lines all the time? All the time. I think for sure, it's it's it's. I, I'll have one. Actually, one is going to surprise you. It's Entourage, Zohan, and are you ready for number three? I bet you never guess. I don't know. The Mentalist. Oh, how many episodes did you do of The Mentalist? Eight. Oh, After okay. Entourage. I had this like sick arc on the show. Wow. And like, oh you, my God. You know why those the network shows get like 20, 30 million viewers? Whereas, it's you know. Other level. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's so internationally, like, you right. know, that was a huge show in France. How interesting. And uh, they went crazy for it. That's so cool. Huh? Well, I want to mention another movie that you brought up to Cadillac Records. You got to play Ravetta Chess, who is married to Leonard Chess. And Adrian Brody plays Leonard. You play his wife, Ravetta. He started Chess Records and he signed, you know, Etta James and Chuck Berry. And you mentioned it before. Beyonce played Etta James. Most Death played Chuck Berry. Jeffrey Wright played Muddy Waters, and it's a one of those music biopics. And I think part of it filmed in Jersey, right? Mm-hmm. Where yeah. I'm from. Okay. The city, yeah. Yeah. So, what was that like making a period piece and also playing a real person who existed? Oh, I love it. You know, I'm obsessed with period anything. Like, <laughs> I want to do a period piece so bad, Brett. Like, so badly. Yeah. I don't know if you saw on my Instagram a couple uh, weeks ago, I posted like this flapper girl picture. I don't know if you saw it. You'll have to go back and look at it. But okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm like posting it for like active manifestation. I'm like, vision I'm board. Like, I'm because I really want to do this. Yeah. Well, the, the movie was the 40s and the 50s and you and Adrian Brody are this, you know, yeah. 40s couple and it looks yeah. authentic. You guys look it like was- you're from that time. It was really, it was amazing. It was amazing doing, you know, a musical biopic of somebody who was just, it was just so a monumental time in music. Yeah. And, um, you know, and to, again, work with like the greats, like Jeffrey Wright. Come yeah. on, guys, genius. <laughs> yeah. Like insane. Um, and I mentioned the movie too, because it won a Grammy. Beyonce's performance of At Last as Etta, J- as Etta James won a Grammy. And then she performed that song for Barack and Michelle Obama at his inauguration in 2009. Oh. So it all kind of came out of your movie, Cadillac Records. That's why I actually didn't know that. That's, <laughs> a, that's amazing. Isn't that she, wild? She was incredible in that film. Yeah. You know, uh, when was that? What year was that? That was 2008. Okay, so 2008. Well, look how times have changed. It's so interesting. It's really sad. Um, that film, if that came out today, would be a massive hit. Mm. Massive hit. Yeah. In 2008, a predominantly all black cast. Right. It wasn't going to get the distribution that it would get today it was a sad reality like it was like it was like stacked up against them and it's so heart-wrenching because when you watch that movie i love it i've seen it a couple of times yeah and i love that movie so much and i think that beyonce did an amazing job yeah like really she was whoa her and adrian brody together right fire <laughs> right even though he was playing your husband <laughs> yeah. what else yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it was really cool yeah that's a cool one to be a part of and i thought it was cool how it kind of 
led to Beyonce performing that song at the inauguration. That's amazing. Uh, and then we mentioned, of course, you reunited for the Entourage movie. Uh, you guys had big premieres in Westwood and in London and all over the world. And the movie, you know, made a huge splash. I got to go to a screen actually at the Playboy Mansion, which was cool. They HBO had a screening there. Yeah. Ah. So I got to see that. Uh, and then in 2018, you joined a different franchise. You were in Super Troopers 2, which was so cool because it had been so long since the first one that they were having trouble getting financing. So they did like a Kickstarter campaign. They raised $2 million in 24 hours and they went off to make this movie and they had all these recognizable faces want yeah. to be a part of it. And it yeah. takes you back to Canada, right? It's a Canadian yeah. comedy. Yeah. But how fun was Super Troopers 2? I mean, comedy, it's just so funny, comedy, comedy. I never, ever, ever in a trillion years would be like that I'm a comedy, but apparently, <laughs> like, well, maybe you are. <laughs> you are, you totally have to just embrace that for sure. I embrace it, I just, or I just keep saying, no, 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 I'm not. So I can keep doing like fun, dope, iconic comedy stuff. Yeah. Um, right, that seems to be the thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you go back and forth. That's pretty cool that you can effortlessly go back and forth between comedy and drama. You know, you're not stuck in one. No, I'm really not. I think that that's true. I'm really grateful for that. I think, um, yeah. you know, I think it's I've I think I've worked very, very hard at 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 trying to go outside the box. Yeah. You know, because every it's the nature of the beast, they just they want to categorize you. Yeah. Put you like is what you do and i and i just feel like no 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 actors do a lot of things oh yeah you did a yeah. dark show before superman and lois your last show before that was the passage which was you yeah. know a drama you know yeah. and that you actually... shut eye on hulu oh yes that's right yeah that was a dark show right I mean, F Isabella Rosalini, Katie yeah. Stewart, um, Angus Sampson, I mean, sick, Jeffrey Donovan. It was so, it was insane. That was like That's one amazing. of my favorite roles that I've ever done, by the yeah. way. Um, and I remember that was when Hulu was starting their own original stuff. Yes. And by yeah. the way, directed by Johan Rank. Oh, Johan wow. Rank, who did the, um, uh, God, he won the Emmy for um, the HBO uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl, right. I mean, like, sick. So that was, yeah, that was Hulu going, you know, again, this was at the sort of more of the beginning shot here right. in Vancouver. Oh, yeah. But so to your point is that, like, I think what it is is that I feel more comfortable doing drama. Like, yeah. I'm in my head, I'm just like, yeah, I want to get, like, dark and gritty and bleh. It's like yeah. the emo with me. But then, like... <laughs> but then like i love doing a comedy yeah comedy just seems so much fun it's just so fun and like yeah. super troopers like those guys oh yeah up it we had so much fun we shot in boston and it was like it was just like the most fun ever it was like a month and a half of like non-stop laughter well you know what's funny with super troopers so you got to play two characters because you were really pretending to be someone else you were like an undercover uh, cop, you know, yeah. and you got to play a Canadian. Yes. Which is cool. I was going to say about the passage too. your co-star on that was Mark Paul Gosseler, who was also known pretty much for comedy. You know, we grew up watching him in Say by the yeah. Bell. Yeah. And it was the two of you in this drama. Did you, were you a Say by the Bell fan growing up? I wasn't. Um, oh, was but it not I, a Canadian thing? Was it more of an American thing? Then, you know, or maybe it just passed me by. I don't know. No, it might have been more of an American thing because it was Saturday morning show. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely not in, no, it wasn't okay. what I was watching. Um, but I was so familiar with him, obviously. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that one was, um, that was a special one. Yeah, I remember you were very, I saw you while you were working on the passage and you were very proud of that one. Uh, it was really special. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was good. It was a, one of those like, oh, how can you give us just one more chance? I know. It's just, it's, an, it's a crazy thing. It's timing. It's the network. It's it's, it's the network. It's yeah. the network, really. Yeah. I mean, timing, yes, of course. But like, 
you know, networks are pretty notorious. It's like, they have to go by the numbers. Like I understand that, right? right. There's like a business. It's just that it's so hard to get a show that is not only entertaining and full of great actors, but also that actually gets critical acclaim. Right. Like, you know, you're always like teetering. Them, like, is it soapy? Is it cheesy? Is it this? Is it that? Like, right. We really had something special on that show. Yeah, I remember you were very, you were felt very strongly about that show, and I think had the ten episodes maybe aired on a streaming service and people could have binged it, it maybe would have gotten the audience that it needed. Hundred. Yeah. I agree. But if that had happened, you wouldn't be able to do Superman and Lois. So everything happens for a reason. <laughs> reason. Yeah. Um, so that brings us full circle to today. Uh, so besides many more seasons of the already renewed Superman and Lois, what is next for Emmanuel Shriki? What do you want to do next? Your guess is as good as mine. I'll let, you know what, Brett? I'll say this. And I, I've kind of said this so many times, but like, I, I really, it's actually a great way to end this. Um, yeah. talk, is that, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Like, A, I am so grateful that I have spent half my life in this business right. and that like, I still get to do it. Even as a 45 year old woman that, times are different enough that I'm not scared. I'm not like, oh my God, I'm 45. And like, time is against me because, because we've lived through so much and it's an incredible time to be a woman. And it's a credible time to be a woman in her forties. Yeah. It's never like, it's literally never been more exciting than yeah. to be in your mid forties and being a woman in our industry right, right. now. Um, so A, I'm so hopeful. And I feel like, this is what I was gonna say, is that every year that goes by, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. That's great. Like I haven't, and I would say this is actually true though. In my career, I would say it's true. I not even done close to what I can do, I haven't scratched the surface. So there's a lot left to do. Like I haven't had that moment of like, you know, doing a, say like a festival film that is just like a, like a tour de force that is like, whoa, did you know that she could do that? I haven't had that yet. I want that. Okay. And, and I and let me let me be very clear. It's not that I want that for that validation. I want that because I can't wait to know what role that is going to be. Um, right? Like what yeah. role is that going to be? It's going to be crazy whatever it is. Right. That you can really sink your teeth into and that you can really show people a side they haven't seen before. Yes. Wow. And that hopefully, you know, feed, you know, listen, God willing, the next 40 years of my career. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I always like to ask my guests before they go, what advice do you have for somebody who would like a career like yours? Never give up. Don't do it to be famous. Mm. Do it because you can't imagine doing anything else. Do it because the thought of not doing it would hurt you. Like, there's no choice. It's too hard. You have to, you have to want it because there's so much rejection. Mm. There's so much heartbreak. But... So you can't give up and and you also just have to keep the faith that like that's my advice you just you can't give up you can't mm. give up we're not all built to do this mm. we're not all born resilient some of us learn to be more resilient as time goes on yeah um, it's hard 
God, is it hard. Mm -hmm. But man, is it rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. A lot of people say to me sometimes, like, how do you always keep such a positive attitude? And I say, what's the alternative? (laughs) You know? Literally, what's the alternative? (laughs) Especially this year. Bam. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, so the very last thing that we do here at On The List is called the mystery question. Okay. Uh, where the guest from my last podcast sends me a mystery question to ask my next guest, whoever that may be. Oh. And actually, Lance Bass stole this and called it the Gursky question on his radio show. So good. <laughs> so I have to send you one. For my next <laughs> guest. Later. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, you have time. And you email it to me. I print it out. I seal it in an envelope. I don't even know what it is. And I read it to the next guest so so the guest on my last podcast was soleil moon fry she has the punky brewster reboot out on peacock she has kid 90 out on hulu so soleil emailed me a question for you for episode 62 okay and soleil asks what is your philosophy on life which is actually interesting because if you watch her documentary kid 90 she asks people that question in the documentary what is your philosophy on life? Oh, wow. What is my philosophy on life? Always have the courage to speak your truth no matter what no matter how hard, no matter how terrifying, because it's only by living your truth to the best of your ability that you're going to live life to the fullest. Wow. Is, is mine. It's, you know, it comes from a quote that Gandhi said, which is, my aim is not to be consistent in my truths, but to live from truth to truth every day. Mm. I think that we are, we're ever changing. We are ever changing every moment of every day. And I think that when we live in our truth, we are in our power. And when we're in our power, incredible things can happen. When we live in our truth, we're open. And like, that's the thing. Like, when we live in our truth, we're vulnerable. When we live in our truth, it's always like it comes from truth that all these blessings happen. Right. So I would say that that's my philosophy in life. Wow. That's a powerful way to end the podcast. Wow. What a joy, babe. That was fun, taking a trip down memory lane. What a trip. Thank How you cool. So <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like uh, half podcast, half therapy session, I guess. Literally, literally. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm telling you, those were a lot of credits. I tried to narrow them down, um, but there's many more. We could have gone on for hours, um, but you've had an awesome career. It's amazing. And like you said, you're just scratching the surface and it's not bad to be scratching the surface with the number one show, the new show on the CW, right? Awesome. It's incredible. <laughs> much babe yeah thank you for doing this that is a wrap on episode 62 thank you emmanuel for being here everybody check out superman and lois tuesday nights on the cw comes back may 18th it's already been renewed for season two so get caught up or you'll be left out Uh, (laughs) thank you again emmanuel thank you everybody for listening and i will talk to you next time bye thanks i wanted to take a minute to talk about the sponsors of on the list hint water eBay, and Magic Spoon Cereal. So first we've got Hint Water. I've got some of my favorite flavors right here. Here's the watermelon, the strawberry kiwi, raspberry, pineapple, and I also love the crisp apple, blood orange, lemon, pear, clementine. Uh, I love all the flavors. So what's really cool about Hint is that there's no sugar, no diet sweeteners, uh, no calories, no preservatives, and it's non-GMO certified. Uh, It's also vegan, contains no nuts, no soy, no gluten, no MSG. And so Hint is offering 
home delivery when you sign up on the Hint website, drinkhint.com. And they're offering new customers 36 bottles for $36 if you use the code NEW36 at checkout, N-E-W-3-6. So go to drinkhint.com and use the code NEW36 at checkout. And next we've got eBay. So if you like vintage sneakers as much as I do, eBay is the place for you. Here's a pair right here. Here's another pair right here. Uh, so what's cool about eBay is that they've got rare dead stock, but they've also got the latest releases. And you can find the exact pair that you're looking for on eBay. So it was actually the original sneaker marketplace, and it's still the place to go uh, to get the pair you've been looking for. So eBay has an authenticity guarantee, and they also have a team of independent professional authenticators performing rigorous inspections of the sneakers that you purchase before they're sent to you. So you can shop confidently knowing that your pair is the real deal. Uh, and for sneaker sellers out there, eBay eliminated selling fees on sneakers over $100. So it's free to sell or flip your collection. Other sites take 25%, but um, eBay waived the fee. So check out ebay.com slash sneakers today. And last but not least, Magic Spoon Cereal. So Magic Spoon Cereal is one of my favorite cereals. There it is right there. This is the peanut butter flavor. Um, so, you know, if you've tried to cut back on sugar or carbs or unhealthy foods in general, then Magic Spoon's the answer for you. So they've got uh, frosted, blueberry, uh, cocoa. I mix the cocoa with the peanut butter. So you have peanut butter and chocolate. Also mix the frosted with the blueberry. And they've also got a fruity flavor. And everyone I've told Magic Spoon about has gotten hooked on it. Uh, so the best thing about Magic Spoon cereal, besides the fact that it tastes so good, is zero sugar, no sugar at all, even though it tastes great. It's also low carb, only three grams, so it's keto friendly, uh, and it's high in protein, 11 grams per serving. So it's got everything you need, and it excludes all the stuff you don't, and it's just really good. So if you go to magicspoon.com slash Brett, B-R-E-T-T, you can make your own variety pack of four flavors. You can choose from frosted, blueberry, fruity, cocoa, peanut butter, and whatever new flavors they have to offer. Uh, then just use the code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout for free shipping. So go to magicspoon.com slash BRETT, and then use the code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout for free shipping. Uh, and I will see you guys next time.